Welcome back to the Mammoth Basketball Hawks Nest Podcast. Hope everybody had a great holiday, a great new year. I know a lot of people are sick out there right now. A lot of tests are coming back positive, and we're dealing with some of that stuff in our own families. And we hope all of you are healthy out there, or at least recovering if you had something. But it's definitely a crazy time right now. Got to protect yourselves, and hopefully everybody's healthy, and we'll get back to Mammoth Basketball pretty soon. But Mark, how was your holiday? How are you doing? Uh, happy holidays, everybody. Happy New Year. Back. Uh, Going to kind of roll through the last month or so of Monmouth basketball with you. And fortunately, uh, just want to send well wishes out to, you know, anybody who's listening, who's dealing with, you know, any sort of, of health going on between COVID and flu and, you know, everything else that's going on here in the uh, start in the heart of winter uh, kind of feels like winter today with a little bit of snow trickling down um, and want to wish uh, everyone involved with the Monmouth basketball program, the best of health. And hopefully, you know, they always say kids are resilient. You know, we don't know who it is. We don't know if it's kids, staff, coaches, but, you know, just from, from Ryan and myself, of course, you know, and all of Monmouth nation, we just want to, you know, wish everybody a quick recovery. Hope that, uh, nothing serious comes out of it with uh, the COVID shutdown to the basketball program. And uh, hopefully they'll be back and healthy and, you know, raring to go mid January uh, in, into Mac play, you know, there, there's no other way to say it. I mean, I, you know, I've had the, the, the team that I coach in high school shut down already. And, you know, you, you live through these shutdowns and you see what it does to, to young kids and young men and uh, it, it can really bur uh, burst their spirit. So, you know, we just want to, you know, lend that support out to them and hope that they get past this and develop some natural immunity and can finish the season strong throughout the MAC and into Atlantic City. Um, and just giving well wishes to everybody, you know, uh, everybody listening, stay well, stay healthy, and hopefully we'll enjoy some, some basketball new basketball together soon, but at least you could take some time to relive some of the positive basketball from Monmouth with us uh, over the next few minutes. Yeah, so it was announced a few days ago that the Marist game on New Year's Eve was going to be canceled. Fortunately, you know, I had, you know, Nicole's dad and grandpa come to the game and we're all excited for it. And unfortunately, that got canned. And then just this morning, it was announced that the Siena and the Iona games for next Friday and Sunday are also postponed because of COVID within the Mammoth program. Um, it, it's unfortunate, but, you know, luckily we'll go over some new MAC policies that are in place now that came about a few days ago. So we're not going to forfeit the games, just reschedule them for now. So that is a positive that comes out of it. But obviously you hope all the players start feeling better soon and that no one's seriously ill. Um, going back to the last time we talked to you guys, it was a sweep over Niagara and Canisius, which is, a very difficult thing to do. They swept the Buffalo trip, which is not common in the MAC. Usually, you lose you lose at least one of those because it's an eight-hour bus ride there and back. And you know, it's a very, very difficult thing to get off the bus, get up for two games where typically no one's in the stands, and especially over the break where students are really not really there, uh, it's difficult to win both. So, good job by the team for winning both. And then they go to St. John's, where it wasn't their prettiest game, but. They hung in the entire game. Even if they got down by double digits, this team kept fighting, and they made a great run right at the end of the game and actually had a shot to tie it at the end. And they went to a Big East building versus solid St. John's team, and they lost by five. It was 88-83 in the end. And Mom went toe-to-toe -to -toe with them on a night where George Pappas had one of the tougher nights of his career. He just couldn't get it going. They did a really, really good job scheming against him. There's really nothing he could do about it. When you have a guy up in your jersey for 40 minutes, it's kind of difficult to get open, even though George is great at it. Um, he, you know, We've talked about him being in the Steph Curry of the Mac because he's so quick and he gets open so well all over the court and just lets it fly. Um, St. John's game, game plan for him really well. So considering he didn't do a whole lot in this game and they only lost by five, it's a good sign for Monmouth going forward. Yeah, a um, couple things. The way they defended George Pappas, obviously, which you spoke on. Shavar Reynolds looked like the best player on the whole court for most of this game until uh, late in the game, Pasha Alexander got going a little bit towards the end. Um, 
Shavar totally dominated the first half and, uh, you know, kept Monmouth in it. Uh, one thing that I noticed was that King Rice went to the zone and the guy who ended up really swinging this game late, hitting some threes against the zone, was the Vermont point guard grad transfer, Steph Smith. And he really hasn't had a huge year there at, for St. John's, only averaging about eight points a game. Um, but he he was a big-time player at Vermont, one of the top guards in the America East. And he really stepped up and hit some heartbreaking threes. And the other thing for me was it looked like the ball was out on St. John's at the end of the game. I thought Mama should have gotten it back and had one more one more chance there. So Oh it was. Uh, it was out. Yeah. So you <laughs> We've know We've seen that before. Yeah, well, we always say when you when you're going into a high major arena, you're really playing eight on five on the court there between the the men in the striped shirt and then, you know, the 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 opposition. So uh, really game effort from Mammoth, one that you wish you, you could have back and and the refs were, would have been able to reward that ball to Mammoth and get that one last shot. But, hey, uh, you could definitely hold your head high walking out of Carneseca, losing a close one to a good St. John's team. So, you know, the farthest it really got, St. John's was up 70-57 later in the second half, and Mammoth went on a really nice run. They went on, let's see, it's, I think it was a 24 to 12 or 13 run. They really had a shot in the end. Um, Pappas got fouled in a three, made all three of them, and they had a shot in the end. A couple of calls went against them, and St. John's pulled away with a few free throws. But, you know, one thing we talk about on this show is that when people mess up, we talk about it a little bit. We try to trash anybody. We try not to make too big of a deal out of it, but we do talk about it. And I do the same thing on Twitter during the games. And, you know, one thing I said on Twitter was McClary had a really rough half. He had a very, very rough half where he looked like freshman, sophomore year McClary, where he wasn't hitting shots, he was turning the ball over, and he didn't look like the Marks McClary that he's developed into this year. And in the second half, boy, he turned it on. That's what I talking. think he. I think he saw your tweet at halftime. <laughs> he might have. And listen, <laughs> we're always fair. Listen, if they mess up, we're going to talk about it. If they do well, we're going to talk about it. And I tweeted right after that that Marcus McClary is playing his ass off because he was a big driving force in why they came back in that game. He was scoring left and right, getting steals, playing great defense. And if it wasn't for McClary, they wouldn't have gotten back into that game. So even though it was a rough first half for him, he definitely jump started himself in some way in the second half. And he got him back into the game. And that's what you look for in your seniors, where if they have a rough go of it in the beginning, they bounce back and they find a way to get back into the game in other ways. Even if your shot's not falling, if you're not fully into the game, um, they have your number that night, you still find a way to be productive. And that's what he did. So, you know, credit to Marcus for that. And, um, you know, it, it was a tough loss in the end because it's one where you look back and look, like, wow, if they get that, they're squarely in the at-large conversation and possibly they're talking about being, you know, not getting ranked, but possibly like receiving votes, one of the top 35 teams maybe, and they lose the game. But it, it's not a game you should be upset about because they played, they really, really played well. And that's really all you can expect when that comes on the schedule in August. If you, you know, you, you sign on for a five point loss to St. John's, it's a solid game. Yeah. Um, Walker Miller was kind of saddled with foul trouble in this one. Uh, ended up only playing 23 minutes, still 13 and five in, in 23 minutes. But the story in this one was that Miles Foster, who had to play a lot more than usual. I mean, he played 18 minutes and he was the scoring machine down he low for so Monmouth. Well. I mean, six of eight from the field, 13 points, eight rebounds, easily the best game of his Monmouth career. And without him providing that punch off the bench with Miller having five fouls, and Ruddy ended up uh, getting four fouls by the end. Shavar had some foul trouble again. Um, but without what Miles Foster gave them, they wouldn't have ever hung around in this game. So uh, b- big time, big time production from that young big off the Monmouth bench in this one. Yeah, last note on this one. Ruddy did a nice job on the board. Ten rebounds for him. Um, Monmouth actually won the rebounding battle, which is surprising <laughs> to the East team. 
They won the rebound battle 43-36. You re- rarely see Monmouth get 40 rebounds in a game. Um, they did a good job there, but the 18 turnovers is really what did them in. But either way, solid game versus the biggest opponent, and they marched right on to Pitt on the road and got a win there. You want to start with that one? Yeah, I mean, Monmouth and George Pappas, we always say, you know, that, that he – it's good to have – a, a short memory in basketball and boy did George Pappas move on from uh, one of his ugliest games of his career against St. John's to you know one of the one of the better games you know that we've seen him ever play against one of those um, major opponents I think he had something like three threes uh, in the first 10 minutes in the game and you know George had it going uh, from the beginning and Mammoth Mammoth stormed out I wasn't able to watch this one because I don't have the ACC network. Um, so I was kind of following along on GameCast. Uh, 17 to 4 lead. Then they were up 31 15, 36 19 and a half. And then they kind of took the air out of the ball a little bit and struggled as Pitt went into a zone defense and Mammoth's zone offense was kind of just, from what I understand, swinging the ball around and not attacking. And, you know, it's hard when you can't watch it. Um, but, uh, you know, at least they hit the free throws down the stretch, played enough defense, you know, and and escaped out of a major power five arena with uh, a really good win for the program. And Pitt actually had been struggling going into that game. That second half since Pitt has been playing much better. So, uh, you know, I think I think we saw Pitt take that second half against Monmouth, who, you know, is now getting more respect as we look around around social media with the the mid-major top 25s and polls and such. Uh, Mom is getting a lot more respect, and I think that Pitt gained a lot from playing a, a very good Mammoth team in this one. Yeah, and looking at Pitt's schedule since then, they beat St. John's. They beat like, a lower Jacksonville team, but they only lost Notre Dame by one. So they are a team that's starting to figure it out a little bit. And listen, are they going to be towards the bottom of the ACC? Probably. But, you know, the more games they win, the better it looks for our resume and our net ranking. So oh, we're, we're huge Pitt fans now. Without we're a doubt. Pitt fans now. Yeah, we're rooting for them the rest of the way. We hope they beat Duke in the ACC final. But, uh, I hope they beat UNC. Actually, I, I disagree, Mark. <laughs> I, I hope UNC loses in the first round and they beat Duke in the final. But that's just me. Um, but going back to this game, Mama just started really hot. And they got up by too much to for Pitt to come back. They were up 17-4 to start the game, 36-9, uh, 36-19 into the half. And Pitt got it going later. Their bigs kind of started dominating us in the paint once they figured that out. And they got it down to a three-point game, but Mama just kept figuring out a way to get a stop, hit a free throw. And they did what they had to do to close out the game. And Pappas went up with 17 points, six rebounds, five assists. Shavar had 14. McClary had 10 and five boards. Uh, Foster had another nice game with six rebounds. So they did what they had to do. They, They went to an ACC building. It's never easy in those arenas. They have the zoo behind them, the student section. I mean, it's not the easiest place to play. Um, although they're not the most talented ACC team, it's still an ACC win. And it's another one for King Rice. Um, you know, every year, every other year, it seems to be they get one or two of these wins, and they keep racking up for him. So it's a good job going to that building and get a W. Yeah, and then they went to another Northeast building. Uh, not the same environment, obviously, as playing at Pitt, but Yale uh, – is right up there with probably one, one notch below Princeton and Harvard in, and Cornell in the uh, in the Ivy League this this year. Definitely an Ivy League um, contender. And uh, the kid Swain, who went for I believe over thirty against Iona a week before, Monmouth really did a great job defensively. Held him to five of seventeen, one of nine from three, seventeen points and. Mammoth again got out to the the hot start. It was a sixteen to six lead. Uh, just continued to ex- extend that lead and dominate, going up 41-25 at half. And then we kind of saw this script before. Yale, you know, marching back, marching back, uh, went on a big run. Actually, got it all the way down to fifty three fifty. But uh, Nikkei Ruddy. Hit eight of nine free throws in this one, and Shavar hit some big ones down down the stretch as well. And Mammoth kind of escapes out of Yale with with a win that'll probably look better 
after Yale finishes and I, uh, what should be a very successful Ivy League slate? You know, it says on ESPN that there were 898 people that attended that game. <laughs> I don't think you could take the fans, the cheerleaders, the scorekeepers, the coaches and players, and possibly people working on campus at that point and make up 900 people. There is no way there are more than a couple hundred people in that building. There was Ryan, nobody. Let's be fair, though. It's got to be pretty hard to study for your Yale finals. So maybe we have to give the student body a little pass over there. Listen, I'm not blaming anybody for not showing up. I'm just saying for an Ivy League, you should be better at math. I mean, there's no, I mean, you're, you're off by like 700 people. There's no way there were 900 in that building. You're looking on TV, there's no way. There are entire sections that were empty. Um, but it's definitely not a game that I expect to be up by that much. Like Yale. They always play you tough. They're, they're never a team that gets blown out by other mid-majors. And going up 41-25 at half, I mean, it, you just didn't expect that to happen. And I said on Twitter, you know, I, I want one of these games where Mammoth just blows out the second half. Like, none of this, not call a timeout, and now it's a 10-point, an 8-point, now we're down to a one-basket game. I'm like, one time I want to see this team just pedal to the metal, step on the mm-hmm. gas, and blow a team out in the second half. Yep, 40 full minutes. As soon as I tweeted that, there goes the lead, and they got it close again. But again, the only thing that matters in the end is wins. And again, we'll talk about this a little more later, but in terms of that large and seeding and things like that towards the end of the year, um, a win is a win. It doesn't matter – if you lose to Duke by 50 or two, it's a loss. It doesn't matter if you beat Yale by five or 40, it's a win. So, you know, a win is a win. That's all that matters. And they went into a quiet arena with no one there and they beat a pretty good basketball team. So, I mean, Ruddy had a monster game. Ruddy was an absolute, one of his best games, probably in his career, 12 points, eight boards and a block. Great game for him. He's really coming on right now. Um, Walker Miller, 16 points, nine boards. Uh, Mama's bigs really uh, just dominated Yale in this game the whole time. Javar with 15 of his own. Pap is not his best night, but he got 8.6 boards. Uh, Mark McClary, same thing, 6.6 6 boards, his typical stat line. And even Chapu had a nice night, 8 points, 2 assists. He was out there for a little while in the second half. Yeah, yeah late late in the game, Marcus McClary fouled out. And yep. Sam Chapu was a, a real steady, calming uh Coming force there as the fifth man on the on on the floor there for Mammoth just showed the the veteran savvy as a senior pass first point guard and he hit six of six free throws uh, some big ones down the stretch as well so kudos to Sam Chapu uh, next man up mentality yeah it's interesting after last year when Miles Roof is the starter and you know he's getting like three four steals a game 10, 12 points a game flying all over the court and you've seen kind of now Sam take back that role. And it's almost like when Shavar came in and miles wasn't a starter anymore. I don't know if he lost confidence or if he's just not getting the minutes and getting to the rhythm. Like last year he was the third option. Like it was Dion, it was George. And then really miles Ruth was the third option for most of the season. And even nights where Hammond was off, um, Miles stepped up. And he hit, he'd have some big nights, and you know he's not a shooter, but he still drives to the basket. He does things that most guys in the back can't do. But it seems like he's taking a little bit of a step back, and I, I just think it's a rhythm thing. I think the talent is there with Miles, the aggressiveness is there, but I think when he's on the court, it looks like he's trying to do a little bit too much, and he's trying to prove himself, which you can't blame him for. He wants to get back in the court after starting as a freshman and then not getting even really 15 minutes a game right now, of course he wants to get out and show out. But it seems like he's trying a little bit too hard when he's out there and he's forcing some mistakes. And you hope that throughout the next season, you know, maybe this is a good break for him right now. He'll settle in a little bit. Maybe McClary and Sam have foul trouble and Miles has to be the guy they depend on. Maybe he has a big night to get him back into things a little bit. But it seems like um, that's kind of what's going on. What do you think about that? Yeah, and actually, when you look at the dynamics of Mammoth, you know, you have Pappas and Shavar Reynolds and Marcus McClary, Walker Miller and Nike Ruddy all going 30 plus any given night minutes, especially the guards. So the minutes really just aren't there. And then if you go to a bench lineup, 
the Chapu Miles Ruth dynamic, it's almost like they're too interchangeable to play in the backcourt at the same time offensively. Yep. Uh, so, you know, I think that that's holding Ruth back a little bit. And Sam Chapu's just played better. Like, honestly, you know, coming into the season, we thought Sam Chapu would kind of be an afterthought and be that third string point guard. And Ruth would be getting the bulk of the backup minutes at the one. Chapu's played better. He's played tough. Uh, he played, you know, really well uh, when other guys missed games earlier in the season and you know you just have to tip your cap to Sam Chapu and as far as for Miles Ruth you know you got to stay ready because from everything we understand he's probably going to be handed the keys back next year to run this whole program so got to stay ready so Monmouth then returned home for a game against Colgate who has struggled we expected them to be a little bit better I think um they're in the Patriot League right they're a Patriot Yes, um, yes. I think we expect them to be a little bit better. They seem to be struggling to start the year. Um, Mammoth barely... caught a break. Colgate's leading scorer yes. and star point guard happened to miss that game. He was at, yes. Yeah, um, so, and, and he actually missed uh, the game after where they lost to Vermont. So I think Mammoth really caught a break. The fact that, yeah, he's missed a few games. He had missed a few games in a row now. I think they're a different team uh with Cummings with Cummings on the floor versus without so I think you know you saw Colgate's guards were shooters but they weren't necessarily playmakers and they really missed that burst and that speed and that creativity um and driving ability of Cummings in this one and I think that's why Colgate was still a game you know a, a tough game and you know they're smart tough kids but most of those kids looked like your typical Patriot League players where Cummings is a very explosive athletic uh, guard that, um, you know, he, he runs it all there. He's 17, over 17 points a game. Um, <laughs> like you said, Monmouth led 30-22 at the four-minute mark, and then they let it completely slip away in a bad stretch, and it was tied at 36 at half. What Colgate was doing is they were putting Monmouth in high ball screens with one of their shooters, and then Mammoth continued to switch, and the Mammoth bigs were stepping over on the guards, and the Mammoth guards were sliding down on the bigs, and Colgate was just getting enough space that uh, Richardson, Ferguson, all their shooters, they, they were just jacking those long threes and really burned Mammoth there at the end of the first half. I had kind of said I wanted Mammoth to change the way they were defending those screens. And I wanted them to jump off the screen at the guard and make Colgate swing the ball to one of the bigs and make the bigs make a play and make a decision to beat you rather than um, making letting those guards spot up for the threes. And credit King Rice and Mammoth, they made some good uh, defensive switches with the way they were handling that pick and, pick and pop action in the second half. And Mammoth was able to uh, pull away at the end and win by 11. Yeah, this is a 30-piece for George Pappas. You just knew it was coming. You knew he was in for a game like that, had a couple where he struggled. And when he's hot at home, it's like, it's like he's, shoot, he's shooting a marble into a pool. Like, <laughs> there's, you just can't slow him down. And once he got hot at the end of the game, I mean, you just really couldn't do anything about it if you were Colgate. Six threes for him, um, even 30-piece. Just an awesome game for George to get back into it. Um, Walker with a monster game. Walker did make mistakes in this game, um, and he has been turning the ball over lately, which is a little bit of a concern. Um, just seems to be making just not good decisions when passing the ball, but we know he's a good passer. Like, he's made some ridiculous passes that we didn't see from guards on our team in the past few years that he's making as a 6'11 center. But then once in a while, he'll make one where he tries, tries to throw it over the head of the defender or – bounced into somebody, and it just gets tipped. And he's had a few of those recently. Um, but overall, I mean, monster game for him. 15 points, 8 rebounds. McClary had 9 points. Javar, quiet night, but he had 9 points and 9 assists. So that was the 9 assists was a big piece. And he said coming into the year, he wanted to lead the country in assists. And that's one of those things that he did a great job of the other night. Uh, and then Foster with another 6 points, 3 rebounds. You know, okay game for him. But that's really, yeah, I mean, those – Three or four guys really led the way and had most of the production in this game. 
But overall, it's a Colgate team that just had a weird season. Like, they're a team that's been on the bracket a few times recently in March Madness. And this year, you know, they lost a close one at NC State. Um, they beat Syracuse and scored 100 on them on the road. It's not the best Syracuse team this year, but it's still Syracuse in the Dome. We've lost by 50, 60 points there in the past. Um, yeah. When they beat Syracuse, Cummings had 18 points and seven assists. So, you know, you take that kid off of that team, and like, like I said, he had missed quite a few games towards the end of December. I think, without a doubt, they're still going to be the class of the Patriot League coming up. It'll be interesting, actually. The, uh, one of the other Patriot League contenders, I believe, is uh, Xander Rice and Bucknell. So yep. it'll be interesting to see them. Uh, I would think they'll probably be among the final four standing in the Patriot League uh, come Patriot League tournament this March. Yeah, they've, they've had an interesting road so far, but um, I, I definitely think they'll be in the mix in the end and they could possibly get on the bracket once again. But overall, a solid win, 77-66, 11-point win for Monmouth. And they rolled right into Hofstra, which didn't go our way, but it's one of those games where it just didn't start out the way you wanted to. And they never seemed to really get comfortable in this game. They made the comeback at the end, but it's just a tough loss where Hofstra always plays us really well. For whatever reason, they've had our number recently. Um, they, we had the ridiculous free throw tip buzzer beater again. <laughs> them a few years back. Jalen Ray, who's back uh, for his fifth year and beat the hell out of us again. You know, they're not in our conference, but he's kind of like Jerry McNamara to, like, people in the Big East or J.J. Redick. Like, you know, this guy has, like, nine years of eligibility. Like, he won't leave us alone. Um, but it was a roller coaster game. And it had a few stretches where, you know, Monmouth did not look like anything how they looked in any other game this year. They really, really struggled for a few stretches. Um but overall, they made the comeback in the end. They got it down. I think it was George that had a three towards the end of the game. And they mm-hmm. had a shot at the end. They, they had a shot um, within the final couple of minutes. And it just didn't fall. And, you know, you have nights like that. And you know, I, I'm right there, right? George took the final shot in that game. Yes, yes. Yeah, so some nights, you know, that's exactly what you want to happen. You want, if you have to be losing in a game, have be down by two or three put the ball on George's hands or Shavar's hands and let them work and set him up for a three. And he took a good shot. You know, he took a good shot. It almost went in. And when it left his hand, you know, Monmouth was out on such a momentum um, swing right there. You felt like it was going in. Like I I was there. I know you were homesick for the game, but I was there. And when it left his hands, you just felt like this ball's going in. And then it didn't, you know, it's a good shot by George, nothing to hang his head on. Um, but it's just a tough loss. You know, it's a game you want to get. Hofstra was coming off a game against ranked Arkansas that they won. And you're like, all right, you know, this is now two of the best mid-major teams in college basketball, especially in the Northeast and the East Coast. And getting a lot of attention from Twitter. You know, like, if we win this game, you know, it kind of erases the St. John's loss a little bit because they're comparable in the net rankings. And we're right back in the thick of it here. And it's a tough loss, but it's not one – you know, you worry about too much. It's not one that you're like, wow, I can't believe they lost that game. Hofstra's a really good basketball team. They're they're eight and five, and they're definitely one of the best teams in the Colonial. I mean, you look at the resume, they've played really, really well. I mean, they beat Arkansas, they beat Bucknell, they beat Princeton. You know, they've played some real they you know, they lost to ranked Maryland by two. You know, they've they've played some really tough teams. Yeah, Houston was ranked. Houston. They were beating they were beating Houston. For all of that game and ended up Houston came back to nip them at the end uh, on opening night. So, yeah, they're legit. Uh, they, they played Iona, you know, right to the final buzzer. Um, Hofstra is a really good program. That's a really great um, non-conference series that King Rice has brought in and, and, and continued. And uh, it's just it's. You know, sometimes when you bring those really good teams in, you have a chance to lose these close games. Uh, If Monmouth had had it put together a little bit earlier in the game, I think they probably could have pulled it out. But you tip your cap to Hofstra, who now has the greatest player in Hofstra history, Speedy Claxton, running running the Hofstra program, which is, uh, you know, that's always a little dicey. You worry, you know, you bring back the – the progenal son, and, you know, you worry if things are not going to go well. Speedy hit the uh, 
hit the transfer portal hard and, you know, kind of restocked Hostra. He can convince Ray to come back for a fifth year. And anytime you have, you have Jalen Ray and they have Estrada who was at St. Peter's, he's a kid who hit, hit the jumper to knock Iona out of the Mac tournament uh, right before the Mac tournament and the world shut down in March, 2020. Um, you know, they, they're, they're loaded. So, you know, it's, it's disheartening because Mammoth has done so well in the early non-conference and then in the Buffalo swing. But like you said, nothing to, uh, you know, be embarrassed about losing to Hofstra, but, uh, George Pappas two for 11 Mammoth's not going to beat many teams, the level of Hofstra with George Pappas shooting two for 11. And I feel confident saying that because George would say that right to you. He's a straight shooter. Uh, straight a shooter at, as it comes, he'll tell you, you know, I need to make more shots. I need to be more efficient. You know, he, he did have the four rebounds and the four assists, but could have really used that last three to go down, obviously. And I'm sure that's stuck with him now as Mammoth has sat on this elongated pause through the holidays and through COVID. Uh, and what we know about George is he'll bounce back in the next one, whenever that might be for Mammoth. Uh, Walker Miller, absolutely dominant. Off Monster game. game. I mean, 26, six boards, the efficiency, nine of 12, three of four from three. McClary gave you 10 and 10. Shavar, 16 and five. Um, you know, Walker Miller was outstanding against, you know, a really good Hofstra team with a good front line and a lot of athletic, long rangey forwards and centers. So uh, need, need, those, need those big performances from Walker Miller. And, you know, that that consistency from the guards to support him rolling into whenever Mac play opens up again. Yeah, Marks McClary, also a great game. Ten points, ten boards. He was all over in this one, two assists. Um, we talked about Pat, but Shavar, 16 points of his own. That's one, five rebounds. Yeah, Shavar, though, limited again with some foul trouble in this yep. one. Yep. That, that's got to stop. Yeah, it's one of those things where you got to take the good and the bad with Shavar because there's so much good. It's like 95% go with Shavar, but he does get those ticky-tack fouls in the backcourt sometimes, and that's also part of him adjusting to Mac basketball versus the Big East because Big East, you can get away with a lot of hand-touching and um, hand-checking and stuff like that. You can't get away with it as much in the Mac, and they're going to call every little thing and turn these games into a uh, free-throw shooting contest. And Shavar's got to know, you know, you get two or three in the first half. Your team's chances of winning that game just took a huge nosedive. So it's something that he knows. You know, again, he's the first guy to tell you that he'll take responsibility for it. He knows what he's got to do. And, you know, it's one of those things that's got to get fixed for Mammoth because, you know, Iona's going to figure out these things. Like, Rick Pitino knows a lot about basketball. Like, he knows about scheming. He knows what to do. He's a Hall of Fame coach. So if you don't think that he's going to have a scheme to take George out of the game, to get Shavar in foul trouble, like he's already planning these things. Like he knows what it's going to be versus Mammoth. So it's one of those things where Mammoth has to kind of figure out how to keep him out of foul trouble and at least keep him on the court, even on a night where George may not have it or they have him locked down. At least Shavar is still on the court. Um, what a, uh, I mean, what a disappointment for from a basketball perspective, obviously from a human perspective, we're more worried about, you know, the, the safety and severity of the symptoms of whoever is yeah. uh, dealing with COVID from, from Mammoth perspective, but from a basketball perspective, what a disappointment that you don't get to see Mammoth Iona. When you start looking at the, the matchups that could be going on in that game with Joyner and Shavar and, Walker Miller and, and Nelly Jr. Joseph and just the the chess match that could happen and the excitement. Um, that's one that, you know, it's going to suck because it's going to get rescheduled for like a Tuesday yeah. night. Yeah. But if we want to swing it in a positive, Mammoth should really try to push that off to later in the year when they have their full student section available. Uh, hopefully it if Mammoth continues to have unlimited fans in the arena, because it, even if it has to be a Tuesday night or whatever it has to be, um, you know, that's one that you don't want. Uh, you don't want the kids on Mammoth 
for the Monmouth fans to miss out on ultimately. Yeah, it's disappointing for sure because you looked at that schedule after coming off um, a few of our last wins, the, you know, the Colgate win, the, the Hofstra game. You're thinking to yourself, you know, this Monmouth Iona showdown, this might be a 12 and 3, 13 and 2 matchup. And you're like, wow, these teams just colliding when both teams are just streaking right now. It, it was, there was just so much hype already around the game. And it's really disappointing we're not going to be able to see it. But we will eventually. Um, it is disappointing to not have it next week. But, again, health and safety of the players absolutely comes first. The staff, too. Um, you got to look out for the health first. And then eventually we'll get to see the guys play. Um, basketball always comes second compared to our health. Um, hopefully these guys are doing all right. We'll come back soon. Um, last note from this game, uh, Jarvis Vaughn, we had a sighting. He only got six minutes in there. Um, got a couple rebounds, but it was just good to see him on the court because he's one guy where you really think he might be a difference maker when it comes to the, the dog days of the Mac where you're just trying to get wins and guys are getting hurt here and there and beat up. And he just gives you that little bit of extra depth behind um, Walker Miller and Miles Foster and Nikkei Ruddy. He gives you that little bit of extra depth where you're not, you know, scrambling. Who do we go to next? Or, you know, Foster might be outside a little bit and he's got to get minutes. You can put Jarvis in there to play defense instead. So it gives you another weapon for this team. And it's really, really nice to see him back on the court. Yeah, we, we love Jarvis. We're, We've always said we think that he could be a missing piece for this roster and this program to kind of put them over the edge into championship material. So hopefully, you know, he can continue to grow uh, as a player and grow with his role on this team going forward. All right. So let's address um, quickly the Mac um, policy for uh, the cancellation of games. So, a couple of weeks ago, it was kind of outrage because they're talking about forfeiting games if it was COVID within your program. And that's just garbage because, you know, the MAC made everybody get vaccinated, which I fully support that. But you can't ask everybody, all right, go get fully vaccinated, do it for the conference, do it for each other, and make everything go smoothly next year. And then, you know what, screw you guys. We're just going to cancel and make you forfeit if you get COVID. That's, that's just not the right way to do things. And I probably tweeted Enzer five times in the last two weeks every time one of the conferences changed their policy. And, you know, I'm sure it wasn't me. I'm sure everybody was pressuring him. But luckily he made a good decision. He changed the policy. So there's certain things in here where you can't have more than five games in a two-week period. I definitely get that. You don't want guys getting exhausted and getting hurt. Um, there's a one-time ex- exception of six games in 14 days. Can't play two games final week of the season. Um, you can really only have three to four um, games rescheduled because they're trying to keep those games on Tuesday nights and they're trying to keep it within not as many games in a certain amount of days. So if you get past that three to four game mark, you may have to wind up forfeiting a game. Uh, but at least it's not, you know, you're not forfeiting six games if your program goes down for a month. So at least that's a compromise. Um, you need at least eight scholarship players and a coach to play the game. So I, I like what they did with it. I think it's very fair. Um, it's one of the better policies I've seen on Twitter. So I think Enzer did a solid job erasing the mistakes they made in the beginning. But um, overall, it, it is what it is now. Like now we just got to get healthy and hopefully, you know, enough people got it now where the rest of the Mac play isn't disturbed for these teams. Yeah, I worry that Monmouth has three games to make up already. Yep. And you start to look at the disadvantage that a Monmouth is going to be at, that they have to play these extra games in the week and, you know, fit in a Tuesday or a Wednesday in between a Sunday and a Friday, especially with a Monmouth team that doesn't go particularly deep into their bench and relies on their core four guys and then, you know, and then Ruddy and, you know, mixing and matching a couple of pieces off the bench. Um, so that that concerns me, especially when, you know, I always say every year when the year starts at the MAC level, what, what am I concerned about? I'm concerned about finishing first in the standings at the end of the year so I know that I'm guaranteed to make the NIT, which is a huge accomplishment for any mid-major program. 
And that's going to be a lot harder when Mammoth has to fit in three extra games midweek in between Sunday and Thursday or Friday, and other teams don't. And that puts Mammoth at uh, a disadvantage when you start when you start to think about that. One thing that I I had wished that the Mac had done was to leave kind of a week or a half of a week open at the end of the year, which I believe they did last year when they were doing scheduling um, for some COVID reschedules so that they weren't constantly bombarding these teams with three games in a week. Yeah, I, I get it. I, I, I don't know. Listen, I've never made a conference schedule before. It's not my job. Um, I, I'm sure it's difficult. I'm sure there are certain regulations and certain NCAA rules they have to follow by. Um, I would have loved to have an extra week for makeup. I don't know if it was realistic for a t- because they have 20 games. It may not have been easy to do, but if they could have worked it out, obviously that's ideal. Um, so I'm, I'm with you there. I don't know if they were able to just not do it because of that. Um, but yeah, I, I, that would have been ideal for sure. Well, yeah, and there's really no time actually when you look at the way that it is now because no. the regular season, you know, Mammoth Mammoth finishes up, I believe, on the sixth. And then you roll right into Atlantic City that week. So it's not like when we were playing in Albany and we were one of the, um, you know, one of the first teams done, you know, uh, conferences done. We're not now. So, yeah, we're, um, we're right up against Selection Sunday now. That's yeah. Nice. So there, there's really no no wiggle room there. And when Monmouth loses a midweek game. Uh, everyone can hear me complain later on in this podcast about how they're on their whatever game, fourth game in, in eight days, and the team they're playing is only on their second game in eight days. And You know, we can dive into that when it comes. But hopefully um, Coach Rice and his staff will have them beyond prepared, which we know he will for all these MAC games. And hopefully, you know, they can continue to win and not have to forfeit any and stay atop the MAC standings. Yeah, I want to address one more thing just before we talk about the elephant in the room. Um, rather large elephant for this show. Um, so one thing I want to do is I want to temper everyone's expectations on <clears throat> what this team looks like when they get back to playing games. Because you got to understand, they're not going to play a game from December 23rd until sometime after January 10th. So pulling up their schedule right now, their next scheduled game is Tuesday, January 11th against Marist at home. So you're talking about a good three weeks, with no basketball. And we don't know how often these guys are evil, even able to leave their dorm because if they're, if they test positive, they can't leave the dorm. If they're showing symptoms, they can't leave the dorm. If they're a close contact, there's probably certain rules with that. So most of these guys probably are not in the gym working out, and you know, you got to imagine it's really difficult for this team to have to deal with this right now. Again, we're not inside the program. Maybe um, they'll talk about it on the King Rice podcast soon. But, um, you know, it, it's a very difficult thing to navigate with COVID right now for these teams. And I, I don't envy them. It's a very difficult spot to be in. But I just want to temper the fans' expect, expectations because don't expect to see the same team play Marist that – played Yale and Pitt and Colgate because they may not be the same team. They may be winded a little bit. They may have to play 13, 14 guys, and you may not see guys playing 35 minutes, and you may lose the game. And we have to be okay with that because they are not coming off of all these wins and in great condition, and hopefully this week that guys start testing negative and stop showing symptoms and then get back in the treadmill and on the bike and start working out and get some shots up. You hope that happens, but there's also a scenario where that doesn't happen and they have two or three days of practice before marriage. So we don't really know what it's going to be, but I just want to temper expectations for the fans. So, so Ryan, they're actually, they're actually set to come back the 14th, January 14th. It's a Friday at St. Peter's. St. Peter's. Okay. Now St. Peter's, their last five games have been canceled uh, due to COVID. I believe four were on the other program side and they just, I believe had their last game canceled on their side. So who knows if St. Peter's will be available for the game. And that's what makes this podcasting now throughout COVID and 
we had kind of spoken to our buddy Guy over at Iona about this as well. It makes it so difficult for us because just like Guy and just like Ryan and I, we like to dive in so hard into uh, scouting the, the next opponents and prepare, you know, our fan base to be well informed for that. And you, you really don't know who you're playing or when you're playing, you know, going forward, unfortunately. Yeah, it's, it's a weird spot to be in. But again, just hope you guys are healthy. And <clears throat> it is what it is. We'll get the version of Mammoth that we get. And eventually they're going to figure it out. Like if they struggle the first couple games back, they're going to figure it out. All right. You, you got to understand at this point, you know, the at large stuff is what it is. If it happens, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But it's about trying to get the number one seed and winning in Atlantic City. So, again, if we want to a two or three seed because we lose a couple early games, it is what it is. Like, you just have to win in Atlantic City at this point. And, you know, we got to see what happens. It, it is, again, I'm going to say it for a hundred times. It is what it is. And we just have to accept it. Um, one, one thing that I want to jump in before you uh, finish up is that it's interesting. Some schools have already started to post their postponed rescheduled Mac games. I believe uh, Sienna had one and someone else uh, posted when they're going to be rescheduled. I'm wondering if at this point, maybe Monmouth is holding off because they don't know who's actually going to be available the next right. time they're supposed to play. And maybe it's just kind of Mac roulette with, you know, yeah. who's available on that day that you haven't played twice. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. It's, it's got to be confusing right now for these coaches to try to figure out when to play who. It's it's got to be thankful, Mammoth fans, that King Rice has been here 11 years and has been, you know, Mammoth's um, coach for all that time in the MAC because nothing that any of those MAC teams are going to bring and throw at him will surprise him. Um, but you know, you think about could you imagine being, you know, first or second year coach and trying to deal with this uncertainty throughout conference play? in uh, college basketball, high school basketball, middle ba middle school basketball, whatever it might be, when you don't have the time to properly scout your opponent and prepare your team and run through things, it becomes extremely challenging. So speaking of coaches, <laughs> um, so let's address the elephant in the room. So um, when I was at work a couple weeks ago, work for the holiday, um, the <coughs> pops up for the King Rice podcast with Badger, Gary Kowal in the program. And I clicked, I'm like, oh, wow, that's cool. So I clicked it. I listened to the whole thing during my break. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. They got Justin Robinson on. They got um, all different inside scoops in the program and different things from behind the scenes you wouldn't know about. And I think it's a really good idea. I, I think the show, the premise of it is really, really cool. And I think it's something that's been missing from the program because – We've said as a fan base, everything is always so locked up and we never know anything. And I think it's kind of cool that they're opening it up. I, I like that. Um, until I got to the final two minutes <laughs> and I heard the quote. It was something like, and make no mistake, this is the real Mammoth Basketball Podcast. If you want more than just opinions, this is the place to come. So I'm like, hold on. I rewinded it and I listened to it again. And the way he's emphasizing real Mammoth Basketball Podcast, I'm like, that's like a direct veiled shot at us. Like, you know, it, it was one of those things that took me a little bit off guard. And, you know, it makes me wonder where that came from, whether that was something that was brewing or something that we addressed on one of the podcasts this year that they wanted to kind of come at us a little bit. I don't really know exactly the reason behind the comment. Um, here's the thing, guys. I'm not going to go crazy on this because he said what he said. It is what it is. But the whole reason I started the podcast was because after the Robinson years, there was one year in between where Josh Newman was still there at the Asbury Park Press. And then he left to do Rutgers and then eventually Utah. And he's doing great things out there now. That year, the Asbury Park Press all but dropped Mammoth coverage. Um, we were a box score. In the paper, we were a little blurb with, you know, maybe the leading scorer. There were no articles. Edelson wasn't doing a whole lot. Like, it just wasn't being covered. So, I'm like, you know what? I don't think that's right because we had all these great years at Mom. And did a great job building up the program with Justin Robinson and these guys. These guys deserve credit and they deserve attention. So, I started the podcast. 
That was the whole reason behind it because no one else was covering the program. And I thought that was garbage. So I started it. I brought you on and the players love it. Like I got Shabar and McClary and George retweeting and favoriting my Twitter stuff all the time. And I know some of them listen to us and Foster's all over it now. And I, I know they appreciate it, and they've told us in person that they appreciate what we do. Um, and you know, guys, here's the thing. The King Rice Show can be a really cool thing, their podcast. It's an inside look at the program. It's, it's like, you know, Jay Wright doing a special on CBS or NBC Sports and going inside the Villanova program with the cameras and showing things you wouldn't see. And then you have Eddie and Steve and Matt Harmon and Callaway on the bar- broadcast. And then you have us, who's like sports talk radio. Like, we're like the fan in the morning or ESPN radio in the morning. And what, are those, what do those guys do? They banter. They discuss the games. They speculate what's coming next. And they make predictions. That's what we do. Like, we, we don't pretend to be this inside source that knows everything about the inner workings of Mammoth. Like, we don't, we're not doing interviews with the players. We've never been allowed to do that. We got a slap on the rest of doing it a few years ago in the summer league. And we never did it again, but, you know, we don't have access to the program, although we would love to have it. You know, we don't pretend to be inside guys like, you know, Jay Williams and Keyshawn and um, even, you know, Boomer, like those guys don't have a ton of access either. Like they have more than we do, obviously. They have a couple, couple guys they know through the workings, but they're not doing interviews and talking to all the coaches all the time. Like, they're speculating. They're, it's sports banter, and that's what fans do. Like, this this is what fans do. And, you know, our fans love our show. We get almost 100 hits every episode. So, obviously, people are listening to us. And here's the thing. You know, the, 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 the people that King Rights wants to listen to his show are the people that listen to our show because those are the real fans. You know, he, he mentioned the real fans a couple of times on his show. And, you know, the thing is, there's a lot of people that join that Facebook group that joined during the Robinson years and have never looked at it since. There's a lot of people that are come and go fans. And there's a lot of fans that are true diehard fans and listen to our show and attend all the games. And those are the fans that are going to listen to both shows. So listen, I encourage everybody to listen to our show, listen to their show, listen to the broadcast with Eddie and Steve. Like, I, I mean, we all do different things, and I think we all do it really well, and I think we can definitely coexist. Like, I don't see any reason why Ken can't do his show, we can't do our show, and Eddie and Steve can't do the broadcast all while coexisting. So that's the one thing I just wanted to kind of get out there for a minute. I, listen, I'm not going back at them. It is what it is. But I am going to make one comment, and that is that <clears> – <throat> After the Robinson years, where they had all that success, there were a couple of years where they weren't so hot anymore. And the fan base on Facebook attacked King Rice. They went all after him. Most, I'm not going to say most. I'm going to say 60 to 70% of the comments I saw on that year wanted King Rice fired. Like, after 55 wins in two seasons, they wanted him fired. And who were the ones that pumped the brakes on the fans? It was you and me. So, you know, we supported King Rice and said, listen, this is not time to be talking about firing King Rice. He's done a really good job building up this program. They're going to go through a rebuild. They lost a ton of seniors, a ton of talent, unprecedented success. Um, They're going to go through a year or two where they're not at the top anymore. And again, they'll get right back to the top, which they did. You know, they've been back at the top the last couple of years. But we said, listen, if he has three or four really rough seasons in a row. Yeah. You begin to start having the conversation of whether he's the right guy for the program, but after one or two kind of tougher seasons, this is not time to be talking about firing the coach. And we were the ones that spearheaded that. So I just wanted to get that one out there because I think sometimes people listen to the show that maybe no King and maybe they only report the negative stuff back to him. But I wanted to make that clear that when everybody wanted him fired, we were the ones that pumped the brakes. So whoever's listening or whoever talks to him, you can bring that right back to him because, you know, we are supporters of King Rice. Like whether you want to think that or not, you know, I know we, you know, we whine about his not calling timeouts and different things that he does on the court, but overall. He also uh, referenced that in the yeah. episode one of the King and the Bowser when they went to uh, reviewing Pittsburgh 
Pittsburgh game, King had kind of said jokingly or tongue in cheek or however you want to say what about it with, oh, I'm sorry, I was thinking about calling the timeout. What did you say, Badger? So, yeah. and, and you know what? It's one of those things where, you know, I don't like what he said. It is what it is. It's his show. Listen, it's his show. He can say whatever he wants to. It's our show, and we also can say whatever we want to. The bottom line is we are King Rice fans because we are Mama fans. And we all want the same thing here between you and me and the fan base and people on Facebook and King and his players and his staff and everybody at the university and President Healy. We all want the same thing. And that's Mammoth on the tournament bracket in March. That's we all want the same thing. We all want success for this program. So, again, do I think it was an unnecessary shot at us? Absolutely. Is it something where I'm going to root against King Rice in this program because they said something bad about us? No. I'm a Mammoth fan. For life. So he said what he said. It is what it is. And hopefully one day we can come to a solution where, you know, maybe we talk it out one day. Maybe, you know, we figure out, you know, the best way to go about working with each other. And maybe we come to an agreement. And maybe we don't. It is what it is. We are, we're going to keep doing our show. They'll, you know, we'll see if they keep doing theirs. But overall, we're Mama fans. We're going to keep doing what we're doing. And we appreciate everybody listening. So that's my that's my take on it. I'm over it. So, Mark, you can talk, you know, talk for a minute on your thing and then we'll get out of here. Yeah. So the King Rice show was hot and heavy back in 15, 16, 17. And then the King Rice show kind of went away during the years where Mammoth wasn't on top. And the Asbury Park press coverage went away in the years when Monmouth wasn't on top. And a lot of the fans that were filling 4,000 plus in the Mac went away when Monmouth wasn't on top. Ryan went out of his way to shed some positive light and give some coverage and some shine on the young men and the coaching staff that were running Monmouth in a time where not many people were going out of their way to do so. Uh, at that point in time, and, you know, previously, you know, whether for 11, 11 years, you know, of King Rice, whether it was 400 people or 4,000 people, Ryan and I were two of them in that arena. And Ryan and I were two of them writing and commenting and, asking beat writers and going back and forth with other fans and you know pouring our heart and soul into living and dying with every bounce of the basketball with this team now mammoth is back on top for the first time in a while and now there's a new king rice show so i'm just going to preface this with i don't believe it benefits us in any way to get into a public podcast quarrel nope. with Coach Rice, who's the leader of the program that we both take our time, effort, and money to support. I've listened to both of their initial podcasts, and I found them to be very entertaining. I do think that their podcast is definitely a different format than ours, as like Ryan had previously said, it really gives that inside look into members of the program. The interview with George was fantastic. Um, and also, I had, I had listened to an interview with George on the All Facts podcast and on the Walkie Talkies podcast, they had George and Shavar. So, you know, the, the access to the Mammoth players on podcasts, maybe that's something that, you know, we should have. If you're letting the Robinson brothers have them, they didn't go to Mammoth, and, you know, they do a great job, or the, the guy from Walkie Talkies who does a podcast highlighting former walk-ons and what they're doing with their, with their careers, you know, that, that might be something where you embrace something that two of your alumni and your season ticket holders and your biggest fans are doing. Um, but, you know, what we do is not give that inside look. We've never really pushed for that. Uh, you know, like Ryan had said, we, kind of went down to the JSBL and we figured we'd be able to interview a couple players down there because Josh Newman had done it, you know, in previous summers, but we kind of were told, you know, you're not supposed to interview the players without some clearance from the program. And, 
you know, uh, so we haven't really pushed for that clearance going forward, but maybe, you know, maybe that's something for a discussion for another day. Um, but I will, I will leave you with this Mammoth Nation and Coach Rice, the, the Mammoth staff, the Mammoth players, um, you know, President Leahy, anybody. You'll be hard pressed to find two fans that care more about the Mammoth basketball program than Ryan and I. And that's shown over four four years now, Ryan. Uh, this is podcast. year four for the podcast. Yep. Yep. As we have led other fans in conversations, added our own opinions, insight, and have frequently gone out of our way to support this team consistently, both at home and on the road. And that goes back, like you know, I've been I've been around since. 04 following the team. Ryan's been around since King Rice's first year, so 11 yep. years for Ryan. And that doesn't even go into mentioning that Ryan took on this task of running this Mammoth podcast four years ago when nobody was giving the program any coverage. With all that being said, I don't feel that we should be classified as the media or the enemy of the coaching staff, Coach Rice, or his players. We're just the opposite. We also don't claim to have any inside information or access to the program, which would constitute us as experts. We're just two passionate, well-informed fans. And we are well-informed based on the fact that we do our research online. We watch Mammoth. We watch their opponents' games. Even when they're not playing Mammoth, we watch their opponents' games. And we stay on top of all things Mac basketball in order to provide Mammoth fans with our takes every week or two during a basketball season. And I'll close with this. Coach Rice has often used the endearing term, he's a Mammoth man, when discussing members of the Mammoth University community. Well, Ryan and I are both alumni, and I actually went back and did my master's at Mammoth as well, and we're dedicated season ticket holders. So as far as I'm concerned, we're both definitely Mammoth men, and I'm damn proud of that. Yeah, I, I am too, 100% on the same page with you. Um, you know, it's it's frustrating when you feel like the enemy, and it, it caught me off guard because the team was so good. I think they were either 9-2 and two or 10-2 and two at that point, and it was before the Hofstra game. And um, it was disappointing because I'm like, the program is riding on such a high right now, and all the vibes are really good, and it just seemed like a really weird time to – go there um but yeah we're, we're two of the biggest mama fans you're going to find um we don't get paid for this we don't have sponsors i'm not getting money from youtube for this like we take we, we take the time out we have fun with it and the players like what we do so until people don't like what we do and they stop listening and you know they people stop supporting us and they say stop doing this we enjoy doing it and Again, we try our very best not to go after anyone. We try to be respectful. I think we've gotten even better at that in the last couple of years. Um, but yeah, we're we're Mammoth fans no matter what. And you know, I, I'm leaving it there. I'm not gonna. I <laughs> I had a few more things to say a couple of weeks ago, but I've kind of calmed down and gotten over it. I'm kind of glad we had this time to not do the podcast because I had a different kind of look outlook on how I wanted to address this. I think it would have sounded differently a couple weeks ago on first reaction. Um, but you know, it is what it is. And, you know, I encourage you guys to listen to ours, listen to theirs. And I think we should definitely both be able to coexist um, because we all want the same thing. And that's mom winning basketball games and championships. So um, that, that's really it for me. That's it. Yeah. Um, in a time where there are much bigger things going on in the world yeah. and even in, yep. you know, in our inner circles, um, as far as health and safety and protocols, uh, we both felt we went back and forth, Ryan and I, on how to address it, if to address it. And I just feel like both of us decided to go about it the same way that we go about everything that we do with Mammoth Basketball Fan Podcast. And that's letting our passion and, you know, our, our true caring about this program shine through. And for everybody who continues to listen with us and continues to support us, we appreciate it. Hopefully, Mammoth will get help, healthy 
get some games back on the schedule, get some wins going, and um, you know, and hopefully we'll have a special march with this team, which we think can definitely happen. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so according to the schedule, it hasn't been postponed just yet, but as of now, um, next game is home versus Maris on the 11th. It may get postponed. We're not sure yet. Uh, if, not, if it does, that'll be Friday the 14th at St. Peter's into a, a few road games after that before we get home for a four-game home stretch, although that four may be turned to more depending on how things get rescheduled. So um, I'm not even going to try to give you the schedule because we have no idea what this is going to look like in the next few days. Um, but overall, um, we'll see what happens with this. Hope everybody's getting healthy. Um, Hope all of you are healthy out there, or at least recovering if you weren't healthy. Um, we thank you so much for listening. And if you know any Monmouth fans that haven't listened to us yet, um, please tell them you got two shows now. You got our show and you got King's show. Um, feel free to listen to both of us. It's all good Monmouth basketball stuff. So if you're a fan, make sure you're listening, all right? Thank you, everybody, very much for listening. Stay healthy out there. Have a great night.